Hi guys! Today we're going to be discussing species of fungi that you might normally find growing in Kentucky and in the central southeastern United States, as brought to you by the University of Kentucky Forest Health Extension Lab. So, there's a lot of different species of mushrooms. We haven't really categorized or cataloged how many species of fungi there are, and there are probably a lot that are not even discovered yet. But the area where we live, the area of uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia and the Appalachians, have some of the most amazing biodiversity of any place in the world. And we have an incredibly, incredibly high number of mushroom species that grow in this area. So there's no way that we can talk about all of these species of fungi uh, today or in any short period of time. But today we're just going to be covering a few highlights, some of the more commonly seen species that you might encounter if you're on an adventure out in the forests in our area. So first up, we're going to be talking about turkey tails. These are Trimedes versicolor. There are a lot of different Trimedes species, but true turkey tails are Trimedes versicolor. And these fungi are saprophytic basidiomycetes. We've talked a little bit before about what these terms mean, but just for a quick recap, saprophytes are uh, organisms that feed on dead and decaying material. They're not parasites. They don't need a living host. Uh, they feed on dead stuff. And uh, that's what turkey tails do. They feed on dead cellulose or dead, dead wood material. So downed logs, uh, dead bits of, of, of trees, uh, not on living trees themselves. And they are a basidiomycete, and that has to do with the kinds of spores they produce. The majority of fungi are either going to be basidiomycetes or ascomycetes. Ascomycetes tend to be things like yeasts, uh, things that might exist in a single cellular format or as microscopic fungi, although there are some macroscopic ascomycetes that you can see without the aid of a microscope. Uh, but today we're going to be talking exclusively about basidiomycete fungi, which are the majority of fungi that we think of as mushrooms, are our basidiomycetes. And turkey tails can be found growing on, on these dead or decaying materials in the fall and into the winter of the year in our area. You know, when we talk about seasonality with mushrooms today, we're always going to be talking about when they fruit where we are. Uh, they might fruit at different times of the year. At, um, different latitudes. So when we're talking about seasonality, just keep in mind that we're always talking about our location here in Kentucky and not other locations where this mushroom might also be, be found. But turkey tails, they get their name from the array of colors in their fruiting body. Some people think it looks like the fan of a, of a tom turkey's tail with all the different colors arranged out there. Um, the top surface of this mushroom is mildly pubescent. That means that it's very uh, slightly hairy or fuzzy on the top surface of the fruiting body. And on the underside, you'd see all these very fine, creamy colored pores on the underside of the fruiting body. Very, very tiny pores that are almost too small to see uh, with the naked eye. And this is going to help you distinguish true turkey tails from some of the false turkey tails. Uh, false turkey tails are some species that might look a lot like Trimedes versicolor at first glance, but if you were to turn them over and look at the the pore surface, the spore surface, you would see that some of them might have gills and some of them might not appear to have uh, any kind of pore bearing structure at all. They would look completely smooth without any pores or gills whatsoever. And these are uh, signs of some false turkey tails. True Trimedes versicolor will always have those little uh, tiny creamy colored pores on the undersurface of the fruiting body. Chicken of the woods. We have a couple of different species of fungi that we call chicken of the woods that grow around here. Uh, and they're Latoporus sulfurius and Latoporus cincinnatus. Uh, these species both grow around here, although Latoporus sulfurius is more commonly found than Cincinnatus. Uh, these are polypore fungi as well. They have pores, again, on the undersurface of their fruiting body rather than gills. They tend to grow on hardwood trees as either 
saprophytes or mild parasites or weak parasites. So that means that they can either feed on dead or decaying tissue or they may weakly parasitize a living tree. They're not a really um they're not a really aggressive parasite that could possibly kill a healthy tree, but they might be found growing on a tree that's already kind of weak or sickly and on its way out as a as a weak parasite. Uh, with chicken of the woods, they're very distinctive for the very bright surface to their fruiting body. That top surface is going to be an array of yellows to oranges, sometimes a deep orange, almost a red color, all the way to a very creamy light yellow. Uh, there's an range of, array of shades within this range of colors that you might see on chicken of the woods. And you can tell Latoporus sulfurius and Latoporus cincinnatus apart by the color of the pore surface on the underside of the fruiting body. Uh, Latoporus sulfurius, as the name might suggest, the undersurface is going to be a sulfur yellow color, a really, really bright yellow. Whereas on Latoporus cincinnatus, that pore surface is actually going to be a creamy white color. Uh, I always think of it as the orange creamsicle mushroom because it looks like the those creamy push pops that you used to get as a kid uh, with that creamy undersurface, very uh, white color, and the top surface being like a very soft orange color on cincinnatus. But you won't encounter that species of chicken of the woods around here nearly as often as you would Latoporus sulfurius, the sulfur poured turkey, um, chicken of the woods. There are quite a few different species of Latoporus in North America, in addition to the two that we normally find here. And uh, there are species that grow on the west coast that are going to be found growing on very different kinds of trees, possibly on conifers uh, or other species of trees, depending upon where they're growing. And it's important to keep this in mind with chicken of the woods because the type of tree that it's growing on can have uh, repercussions and impacts depending upon why you're hunting for this mushroom to begin with. So with a lot of mushroom hunting, you want to uh, also brush up on your tree ID skills so you can look at a tree and, and know what kind of host that mushroom is fruiting on because different hosts can actually impact uh, the chemical makeup of the fungi that might be growing on them. Maitake, these are sometimes called hen of the woods, but I find that confusing. Uh, be of chicken of the woods, hen of the woods, you start to get all of this poultry running around. So I usually call them maitake rather than hen of the woods, but this is Griffula frondosa. Uh, it is also a polypore fungus. We're going to talk about a lot of different polypore fungi today. And much like some of the others that we've discussed, uh, maitake can also be either parasitic or saprophytic. Now, unlike chicken of the woods, the Latoporus species, or the turkey tails, which were both weak um, parasites, these guys are a little bit more aggressive, and they can be pretty voracious parasites on, uh, on oak trees or sometimes beech trees. Those are the two most common tree hosts for this species, are either oaks or beeches in our area. Uh, the top surface of this mushroom, it's going to be a gray to brown and kind of ruffled. I think that's where it gets the common name sometimes of hen of the woods, is that the top surface resembles the ruffled feathers of a hen, possibly. Um, but the pore surface, the undersurface of this mushroom, is going to be a white color with very, very tiny, minute pores that you can barely see uh, on the undersurface of the fruiting body. They like to fruit at the base of hardwood trees in the fall of the year, so you're not going to look for them growing halfway up the, the trunk of a tree. You'll see them at the base, um, like I said, most often in our area on oaks or beech trees, fruiting in the fall of the year. Cauliflower mushrooms, we don't encounter those uh, quite as frequently as some other fungi around here, but they are still found in our area. And unlike some of the other mushrooms we've talked about so far that were uh, polypore fungi, these guys are actually coral fungi. They don't have pores, they don't have gills. All the spores are going to be born just on, along these branching structures of the fruiting body of the fungus. And like some of the others that we've talked about, they can be parasitic or saprophytic. Um, they have this ruffled white fruiting body and they're found growing in both the eastern and the western United States. Um, you know, in the eastern U.S., we have Sporisus crispa, which is the species on the left. 
Uh, but if you move out to the western U.S., places like Oregon and Washington, you're much more likely to run into Spirisus spatulata, which is the species here on the right, and which to me looks almost exactly like a head of cauliflower. You know, I found one of these once and was just completely ecstatic. It was a very exciting find. Um, but these species are generally associated, associated with hardwood trees. Occasionally you can find them growing with conifers, but hardwood trees are, are much more common. And they tend to fruit in the late summer to early fall of the year. And uh, Spirisus spatulata is the, the species of Spirisus that we have in the eastern United States here. Next, we're going to talk about lion's mane fungi. And lion's mane fungi may be one of several different species, uh, but they're all within the genus Hericium. Uh, Hericium americanum is by far one of the most common species of this genus to find in the eastern U.S., but you can find others as well. These fungi are saprophytic to mildly parasitic, just like a lot of the others that we've talked about. Uh, they're not polypores, they're toothed fungi, so all of their little spores will be found growing along these teeth that tend to hang down like icicles off of the fruiting body. Lion's mane fungi are going to be pure white in color. There's no other funky colors going on. Sometimes as that fruiting body ages a little bit, you might see a little bit of yellowing near the base of the fruiting body where it meets the substrate of the host tree, but otherwise they're going to be pure white. And they fruit from late summer through early winter, depending upon where you are and depending upon which species of Hericium you're looking at. Uh, and there are multiple species in North America. We have Hericium coralloides, Hericium americanum. Uh, there's also a Hericium aricanus that we also find here in the eastern United States. And they primarily grow on hardwood trees in our region. Again, as with some others we've discussed, if you look out west, you might see them growing on coniferous hosts. But here in the eastern U.S., they're almost always going to be found, or should exclusively be found, growing on, on hardwood trees. Oyster mushrooms are a mushroom that you may have already heard of. They're in the genus Pleurotus, and Pleurotus ostreatus is by far the most common species of oyster, oyster mushroom that we have in our region. Uh, they're saprophytic to weakly parasitic. I think you might be sensing a little bit of a theme here in some of the fungi that we've talked about, but this will change. Uh, but they tend to fruit from the spring through the late fall, depending upon their strain. Uh, oyster mushrooms are very versatile. They're one of the fungi that people most commonly cultivate and grow. Uh, when they get into growing fungi themselves, oyster mushrooms are usually where they'll start because they're pretty vigorous and they do have a wide range of temperatures that different strains will grow at. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of variability in when these guys will fruit. They can be found fruiting in the spring or sometimes in the fall and early winter with snow on them even, like the one in the picture here. The fruiting body of this fungus can be tan or gray, uh, sometimes white on the upper top surf, upper surface of the fruiting body, but on the undersurface of those the fruiting body, you're going to see gills. And this is the first mushroom that we've talked about today that has gills rather than pores or teeth. Uh, but they will have these decurrent gills, and decurrent means that they run down the stipe, the stem of the fruiting body. But they'll have these decurrent gills that run all the way uh, down the fruiting body of the mushroom. And they're called oyster mushrooms because they tend to have a very mild, almost fishy aroma to them that you can smell pretty readily on these guys. So uh, if you think you might have found them, giving them a, a good whiff and seeing if you get that fishy odor of oyster mushrooms. Next, we'll be talking about chanterelles and trumpet fungi. And this is a very diverse group of fungi. There's over 46 different species of chanterelles and trumpets in North America. Uh, and for that reason, rather than talking about them individually, we're actually going to just kind of loop them together as a group and talk about them all at once uh, because they do have some key features in common. Uh, chanterelles and their relatives, they tend to fruit in groups. Uh, almost exclusively, they grow out of the ground. They don't grow on the wood of a host tree with a couple of exceptions. Uh, for the most part, they'll, uh, they'll just grow straight out of the the soil as it were and they tend to grow in in large groups so where you see one of these guys 
uh, look around very likely you're going to see more growing nearby. They're usually going to be some shade of yellow or orange, although there are a few exceptions like the Horn of Plenty, uh, which is a, a pure black uh, relative of a chanterelle. And for the most part, chanterelles are going to have these uh, decurrent gills that run down the stipe of the mushroom and that are more or less pseudo gills. They're not true gills that are very deep and, uh, and sharp edged. These tend to be smoother, uh, softened gills that are almost folded over and not so pronounced. Uh, they're, they're like the pseudo gills. They're folded over, they're a little softer looking. And very distinctively, the gills of chanterelles tend to fork as they reach the margin of the cap, as you can see here, uh, the little forking or, or branching of the gills that tends to occur as they reach the margin of the cap. Often they'll have an odor to them. They might have an aroma kind of of apricots is, is a common way that people describe it, but they do have a distinct odor to them. And you'll see them fruiting throughout the growing season in the eastern U.S., depending on the species of chanterelle or trumpet fungus, they can start fruiting as early as May in some, for some species and moving all the way through the summer into the early fall uh, as the different species fruit at different times of the year. You've probably heard of this next group of fungi before. The Morcella genus, these are the morel mushrooms. A very, very famous and well-known group of fungi that are found growing throughout North America. They tend to fruit very early on in the spring of the year, uh, when the first leaves are just starting to unfold on the trees, and when you might be seeing a lot of spring ephemerals, uh, spring wildflowers that are growing up. That's the time of year when you might expect to find morel mushrooms uh, fruiting wild. And they tend to fruit in mass, like chanterelles, where you find one, you're very likely to find many more nearby. Uh, they tend to like growing in, in wetter, moister conditions, damp soils. And it, depending on where you are, they're known to associate with different species of trees. But that tends to vary uh, dependent upon your geographic location. These guys have a very distinctive uh, fruiting body. Rather than gills or pores or teeth, they have this very pitted, honeycomb-shaped fruiting body. And while most of the fungi that we've talked about today are basidiomycetes that have basidiospores, these guys are actually ascomycetes. They are much more close to a lot of yeasts and other microbial fungi than they are to a lot of the other mushrooms that we've talked about today. They just happen to be... Uh, macroscopic in nature and have this distinctive fruiting body that you can very easily see. Now when we're talking about identifying fungi, it's important to remember that things aren't always what they seem. You know, you might uh, look at a mushroom and at first glance it looks like uh, something like maybe a morel, uh, but fungi can be pretty tricky and sometimes they're very difficult to tell apart. And it's important that when you're trying to identify fungi, you always identify them correctly. And so just keep in mind that sometimes what you, uh, when you see a mushroom, it might not be what you think it is at first. And here you can see a little bit like what I'm talking about. On the right hand side, you have a true morel mushroom. And on the left hand side, you have a this mushroom from a genus Biometria that are called false morels. And false morels are, as their name sounds, not true morel mushrooms, uh, but they're a group of fungi that tend to fruit about the same time of year and in very similar locations to morels. And they do look somewhat similar. And every year, people confuse these mushrooms and they mistakenly harvest these false morel mushrooms, believing them to be true morels. But as you can tell, there are differences between these fungi. There are ways that you can tell true morels and false morels ap apart. True morels, like you see on the left, they tend to be hollow in the center of the stipe, whereas the false morels on the right have a lot of tissue in the center of that stipe. They aren't hollow. And secondly, true morels have this very pitted uh, honeycomb shape as well to their fruiting body, Whereas false morels, that, that pitting is just, it's different. It's not as 
deeply grooved and divoted as on true morels. And there are other differences to look for as well. So educating yourself on the characteristics that are, are hallmarks of the mushrooms that you're looking for is very necessary as you start to get into mushroom ID because these are two fungi that you don't want to mix up. Another cautionary tale would be Pleurocybella or angel wing mushrooms which at first glance can look a lot like Pleurotus oyster mushrooms. Uh, but these fungi are very different from one another. Uh, Pleurocybella, while it looks quite similar at first, has a much smaller and more delicate fruiting body. It's more fragile. And they're always going to be this pure white color, as opposed to the variety of colors that you might find on oyster mushrooms. But Pleurocybella, you know, they, there have been consequences in the past to people uh, foraging for these these fungi. Um, in 2004 in Japan, at least 17 people died uh, with for, for reasons that were directly linked to these angel wing fungi, to Pleurocybella. Uh, they had acute encephalopathy uh, in, the, in their brain tissue and also kidney fail, failure that was associated with consumption of these fungi. And while we still don't know exactly why this occurred after consumption of these mushrooms, it is definitely uh, agreed upon that it was consuming these fungi that ultimately led to the deaths of these people. And so, you know, therefore it's, it's important to be able to tell the difference between Pleurocybella and Pleurotus oyster mushrooms and just mem remembering that being able to identify fungi correctly is really important. Another example of this that we might more commonly see in our area are chanterelle fungi and jack-o'-lantern fungi, the Omphalotus uh, genus, which is kind of a funny sounding genus name, but often people will confuse these two, and I see this every year. People will say, hey, I found chanterelle mushrooms, and they'll show you the picture, and it's this big cluster of jack-o'-lantern fungi, uh, but these are... are fungi that you don't want to mix up. Um, Jack-o'-lanterns tend to grow from a big cluster at the base of the tree, all with a single uh, uh, stem, as it were, and uh, growing from the base of a tree as, as a parasitic fungus. They also have true gills uh, that run down the stipe of the mushroom, um, but you don't want to confuse these two. Jack-o'-lantern fungi can lead to serious gastrointestinal distress, they're not a mushroom that you want to confuse at all, and it's important that you understand how they look different from chanterelles, which, uh, you know, chanterelles have those pseudogills that fork at the margins of the cap. They tend to be white when you cut into their flesh. They have that apricot odor to them, and while they fruit in groups, they're not all fruiting from a single base as a cluster, and they won't be growing from the base of a tree. They'll grow around trees, but not out of the base or roots of a tree like jack-o'-lantern mushroom might. So, uh, you know, you get another example of really being confident in identifying the fungi that you're looking at. And there's no greater advocate for proper fungal ID than the destroying angel mushroom. You know, this is this beautiful little pure white mushroom. It looks so sweet and so innocent, but the destroying angel is one of the most toxic mushrooms that we have in North America. This mushroom is very likely to kill you if you ingest it. Almost every year, one or two people die after inadvertently consuming this mushroom, believing it to be something that was safe to eat, when in fact it's, it's an incredibly uh, dangerous fungus to consume. But it's this beautiful little innocuous pure white fruiting body uh, I kind of wonder if sometimes people look at them and think that they resemble the little mushrooms that you find in the grocery store, and so they think they're okay to eat, not realizing quite how toxic this mushroom is. Um, you know, they, they do kind of look similar to the little pizza mushrooms at first glance, even though they are incredibly different, you know, different genus, you know, and different family of fungi even, um, but really understanding how to tell them apart because they're a mushroom that could very well kill you and if it doesn't kill you you're going to need to have organs transplanted and either way 
it's not going to be fun. Um, so really understanding how to identify fungi and being sure to identify them correctly is so, so crucial because improper fungal ID can have very serious consequences. We, we do have a number of very toxic species of fungi uh, that can be found all over the world and even right here in North America. And all of these, the, the death cap, although we don't find that one nearly as commonly around us, uh, the destroying angel and the deadly gallerina, these are all lethally toxic species of mushrooms that we have right here in North America. So, m hunting for mushrooms and learning to identify mushrooms can be so much fun, uh, but it's not necessarily something to be taken lightly. You always want to exercise some level of caution when you're getting into mushroom ID because there can be very serious consequences. So if after all of this scary stuff about kidney failure and brain lesions and death, you still want to learn about mushroom ID, there are some good resources out there that can help you get started. Uh, websites I particularly love, uh, Mushroom Expert, the MycoWeb, and Dr. Tom Volk's Mushroom page. Um, these are all really wonderful resources that can help you learn about uh, Mushroom ID and ecology and just have some really awesome information about fungi in general. Uh, these are all, all websites that I highly recommend. You know, everything you see online, you, you have to take it with a grain of salt. And it's very important to be conscious of where the information that you're processing is coming from. But these are all very legitimate um, sources of information that will, will not lead you astray by telling you things that are incorrect about, uh, about mushroom ID. If you want to get a, a field guide or a larger book to help you learn more about mushrooms and mushroom ID, these are a few that I really love. Uh, Mushrooms of the Southeast is a great reference guide. Mushrooms Demystified, this is a little bit large to take into the field with you, uh, but it is by far one of my favorite books to really dive deep into fungal ID. And uh, All That the Rain Promises, it's actually more of a book for ID in the Pacific Northwest, but David Aurora is an amazing author, and he just he makes learning about mushrooms really fun. He takes such a great approach to it, and All That the Rain Promises is a really wonderful book to get you engaged and interested in learning about mushrooms. I would advise staying away from mushroom hunting apps. You know, as we've seen, sometimes the nuances of how different mushrooms are different from one another uh, can be very, very minute. And sometimes these nuances and differences can't be picked up with the apps and the algorithms that are associated with them. So I would encourage you to, to stay away from mushroom hunting apps to make a really solid ID. Sometimes they can kind of help you in the right direction to like what family of mushrooms you might be looking at. But do not rely on these apps to give you a strong and solid ID on the type of mushroom that you're viewing. Just my opinion. Uh, also, you can talk to your extension office. Uh, there might be someone at your local extension office who's knowledgeable about fungal ID, or they might have some other resources that they can point you in the direction of to uh, find more information. And also, Kentucky Forest Health Extension. You know, we have a variety of resources about mushrooms and fungi that are available for your perusal. So don't forget to check out the resources that we have available uh, about fungi and fungal ID in Kentucky and throughout the southeastern U.S. All right, thank you all for joining us today to talk about just a few of the common fungal species that you can find growing here in Kentucky. Uh, don't forget to engage in really proper and thorough ID techniques. And I hope that you have wonderful times out hiking and exploring in the woods and taking lots of beautiful pictures of fungi. Thanks for joining us today.